Hi, students. Uh, we're back for another week of adult development, and we're going to talk about uh, chapter nine, which is social interaction and social ties. Okay, so we'll talk about that as those apply to our uh, our interactions over the adult um, lifespan. Okay, so social interaction, social ties. And we're looking at chapter nine. <clears throat> now, your chapter talks about uh, patterns of interactions and social ties uh, in older adulthood, but we can also think about them in terms of you know young adulthood, middle adulthood, and older adulthood. And you can think about your own life. You can assess your own daily social activities and come to some conclusion about how many social ties you have and how many interactions you have with others, okay? So think about that for a minute. And then what are the qualities of those ties and interactions? Are they negative? Are they positive? Uh, are these people close to us? Are these people acquaintances? Etc. And so we can start to think about our social network, right? Now, uh, of course, in infancy and childhood, um, we have kind of limited interactions with others. But as we get into the school setting, of course, things change and we have more social interactions and activities with others. And some people are, you know, positive influences on us, and some people. <laughs> are negative, okay, to us. So, you know, you think about these interactions and how they affect us psychologically. And then you go into an adolescence and emerging adulthood and young adulthood. And, um, you know, you begin to uh, gather a bevy of um, lots of social others in your networks, usually. You know, if you're, even if you're intro, uh, you're an introvert, um, you know, you still interact with people, okay? Uh, so, you know, these are your social networks. And then we'll talk about how those change or stay the same across uh, adulthood, okay? Now, as we move through adulthood, it says here, situations change, social networks change, and our social ties and interactions with others play a role in determining life satisfaction, well-being, and adaptation to changing circumstances. And so, you know, you're in college now, you're interacting with some of your classmates, some of your friends, um, maybe you're working, right, to get yourself through college, and maybe um, you have all those work uh, uh, colleagues, okay, that you deal with on a regular basis, and and psychologically, you know, you have to think about how satisfied are you with your life, okay? That's a psychological variable, um, and how is your well-being? In other words, you know, uh, do you have kind of a positive well-being right now, or is it a negative well-being because things are kind of up in the air for you, okay? Uh, etc. And then, you know, we have to adapt to all sorts of uh, transitions in our lives. So we're thinking about, you know, moving into a career, graduating from college first, right? Moving into a new career, uh, having new um, colleagues at work, and then maybe transitioning into a romantic relationship if you're not already in one. And then, children, etc. right? And then you think about your parents, if you have them, and you think about your grandparents, if you have them, and all of these people kind of uh, influence the way you feel about yourself, your satisfaction, and your well-being, okay? And how well can you adapt to all these changing circumstances? All right. And these interactions, these social ties that we have with others, uh, really affect the way we feel psychologically, okay? Now, the book says, as we move into older adulthood, there are fewer opportunities for social interactions uh, because some people, although not all, will retire at some point uh, from work, 
And then maybe they'll have a loss of some of their close friends or the loss of their spouse or the loss of some of their loved ones or partners. And then sometimes, you know, people will deal with health problems. And so that affects psychologically the way people think about their, um, their well-being and their life satisfaction. Okay. Now, the theories that are outlined in the textbook speak to these age-related related declines in social interactions and changes in social networks. Now, you can think about, you know, yourself and you can think about others that you know. And the book kind of talks about averages across people or commonalities that we have. But of course, we can think of exceptions to all of the um, items that uh, are presented in the book, okay? And so they're just talking about average behavior across certain individuals, okay? Now, there are theories that are presented in the book. Some are old theories like activity theory and disengagement theory, and those have been in use for several decades. Uh, but uh, as I've said before, and I'll say again in this course, uh, the newest theory and the most applicable theory is called socio-emotional selectivity theory, okay? And that, that was uh, kind of put together by a gerontologist. Her name is Laura Karstensen, and she works at Stanford University here in the U.S., okay? Now, her theory overall accounts for motivations in life, as I've said before, okay? In early adulthood through middle age, we try to gain information and gain knowledge so that we can deal with uh, the world, okay? In order to prepare for work, relationships, finances, and other life domains that are important to our survival and building our lives, okay? Now, there's not much research on children in this area, and your book does have a little figure there that shows that kind of emotion, emotional regulation is important from infancy through childhood, but then this information gain becomes an important motivation for most people um, as they move through adolescence and emerging adulthood and on through middle age, okay? Now, at some point in middle age, as this says, uh, we're going to think that, you know, we're going to have an end to our life at some point. Time left in life is limited, and our perspective kind of changes um, on what's going to happen later. So we start to change our primary motivation from gaining information, lots of information, to regulating our emotions, okay? And I've said this before, but I just want to point it out because it's uh, it's explained in this chapter, okay? We begin to surround ourselves with positive people in our social networks and kind of cut down the number of people in our social networks. And usually those cuts are made to people who cause us negative emotions as much as possible, okay? And we're still going to have some children or some cousins or some relatives, right, that cause us kind of ne negative experiences, but, uh, you know, we're going to try to minimize our contacts with uh, people who cause us negative emotions, because during this emotion regulation uh, motivation period, we're going to want to start to feel positive about ourselves as we move toward the end of life, okay? And so this creates a positive buffer in our interactions with others. So you can see how social networks will change or are predicted to change by this theory, okay? And it's built around your perception of time left in life. For younger adults, um, the perception is that really time is unlimited. I have lots and lots of time and I can you know, gain information and I can uh, learn what's important for my career and other areas of my life. And then at some point in middle age, you see that time is limited. Okay, so you change your primary motivation. Okay, now in your book, 
there is this interesting model. Uh, it's called a social convoy model. All right. And uh, if you think about it, we are kind of surrounded in our um, ecology by different kinds of people who are either close to us or not so close to us. Okay. And so Antonucci came up with this social convoy model. And we, he says that we have close or very close, close, not so close, and not close at all, people who are in our social networks throughout life, okay? Now, the people in our social networks serve many purposes, but uh, many of those people provide us with support, okay? Psychological and emotional support, social support in terms of coping with either positive or negative life experiences, they give us advice and support when we have financial or other difficulties. And our social networks provide us with a buffer against all of those stressors that we have to face as we move through life, okay? So you can think of your very close network as being just a really small, uh, very tight-knit group. It could be parents, it could be your spouse, it could be your children, right? That, you know, they're in our very close network because, you know, it would be very difficult um, if one of those members were to go away. In other words, maybe we lose them at some point, okay? So that's our very close network, and they provide us with all kinds of supports. All right, in the uh, close network, we have all of our other relatives, all right, brothers and sisters and, and siblings, et cetera. Uh, aunts and uncles and things like that, right? Uh, and friends, right? And we feel close to these people and they also provide us with some supports as, as we need them, okay? And then you go to the next uh, kind of concentric, concentric ring, okay? And those people are not so close and not close at all uh, members of our networks. And these are people who still provide us with some supports, okay? We might have uh, people that we work with or people that we socialize with in the not so close uh, ring there. And then we might have acquaintances such as the mail person, the person who delivers your mail, a uh, bank teller, right? Or those people provide us with services, the doctor, right? And people we rarely see. Okay. Now, you know, in our digital world, of course, we have all these uh, electronic friends, okay, and electronic acquaintances. And depending on your personal relationship with these people, they may fit into any of these concentric rings, okay? Uh, so you can think about your social convoy, okay, the people that you pull along through your life and they help support you in some ways, all right? Now, I'm gonna close this uh, lecture and then I'm gonna go to, uh, to a uh, paper that I published. Let me see when I published this. It was way back in 2005, okay? Long time ago. And I'm gonna show you that I looked at uh, people in the free world who weren't incarcerated and people who were in prison to see if this theory uh, and this social convoy model fits both inmates, prison inmates, and people in the free world. So I went to prison <laughs> during this time, and I'm going to show you what I found. Let me go down here. All right, I have people from 18 to 84 years old. You can see age along the x-axis in this uh, figure, right? And then I had number of social partners on the y-axis going up, okay? And I measured these. And you can see that this kind of blackened area at the bottom are the very close partners. And at age 18, those average about, you know, seven to eight people who are very close, you know, so close that you can't imagine life without, okay? But you can see that this line slightly declines 
As you move toward 84 years old, it might be uh, more like six and a half to seven people who are still part of this very close network. So this very close network doesn't change much for people who are not incarcerated, okay? So the very close network stays relatively stable across your lifespan, according to the research that I did here. All right, if you look at the close network, that kind of declines somewhat, okay, as relatives pass away or as cousins, et cetera, and go away from you. Uh, that very, that close network, that's the second one, kind of diminishes over the time period from when you're 18 to 84, all right? Now, the third uh, kind of gray area here, these are less close people, people you work with, um, you know, and people that uh, kind of support you in some way. Uh, but you can see a real big decline from age 18 to 84 in that network, okay? Because, you know, at some point you start to retire from work, right? Towards the end of uh, your 60s or into your 70s. And that network becomes really small, okay? So that diminishes over time. And then from 18 to 84, for the not close partners, people you think of as your support people out in the community, like your bank teller and mailman and things like that, or male woman, okay, those diminish as well. So you can see these two, these two outer um, uh, pieces of your social convoy really kind of diminish a lot over time. Uh, as you age, but these two inner uh, circles, right, that are close to you, very close, those stay relatively stable over the, over the lifespan. Now, this is for non-inmates, okay? Now, what would you think about prisoners? What do you think their um, social networks look like, okay? This is something that was brand new. Hadn't been done in research before, but you know, this was brand new in 2005, okay? And many people have cited this paper, uh, other scholars uh, who have done more work since then on this uh, idea, okay? Now let me scroll down to the inmates networks. Isn't this interesting? I also looked at prisoners who were in prisons uh, from 18 to 84 years old, okay? And you can see that their very close network stays pretty stable across the lifespan, doesn't it? And their close network stays the same across their lifespan. However, these two outer um, concentric rings diminish over time, okay? Um, and you can think of, you know, correctional officers or... Uh, or prison counselors or, or um, religious kinds of organization, people who come into prison to support prisoners, those guys are probably in this third band. And then the fourth band are just people that, um, you know, maybe mail you letters or something that you don't know very well. And that diminishes a lot. Uh, so this is, if you look at this, the, uh, the network is condensed, isn't it? Uh, you don't have as many people in prison uh, that you can feel that are parts of your social network as people who are out in the free world, right? But you can still see the trajectory is the same for prisoners as it is for people who are not incarcerated, okay? And this is interesting, isn't it? And that was the finding in this study, okay? So I don't know if this is available uh, at the library or anything else, but this was a, an interesting study that we did over at New Mexico State uh, in 2005. And we went to prisons in Mississippi, Kansas, and in New Mexico uh, to do this work, okay? And then we got comparable people out in the communities in each one of those areas to participate, okay? So you can see how uh, the social convoy model uh, kind of picks up the number of people that are in your uh, social networks 
and uh, the number of people decline, right, over, over age, but those very close and close network members stay relatively stable, okay? So that's something you can take home from this, uh, this lecture, all right? So enjoy your week, do your work, uh, look at the syllabus and the tentative course schedule to see what you need to do and get that done for this week, okay? All righty, I'll see you next week and enjoy the rest of the week. Bye-bye.